The reason blood pressure or high blood pressure is important is because high blood pressure is associated with complications over a number of years. If you leave high blood pressure to be unchecked, then there is a higher incidence of things like heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure over a number of years. What happens these days is you go to a doctor, the doctor measures your blood pressure, and then he says, oh, you have high blood pressure, and then he starts you on medications, and you are consigned to those medications for the rest of your life. To know how to treat high blood pressure, I think a better way is needed. To know how to treat high blood pressure, we have to understand what high blood pressure is. Now, this is also very interesting because at this point in time, high blood pressure is defined by a number. So if you take a bunch of people and say, what is high blood pressure? You will get different values for the number. The Americans say that high blood pressure is a number of greater than 130 over 80. The Europeans say that high blood pressure is a number greater than 140 over 90. So if there's that discrepancy, what does that mean? Does it mean that if you are European and you, that does it mean that your risk changes depending on which continent you're in? Um, and the other thing which is really interesting is that numbers change. So the Americans once upon a time used to say that the blood pressure of 140 over 90 was high blood pressure. Then they changed it and they said, oh, now 130 over 80 is high blood pressure. The numbers aren't even steadfast. So I personally don't like the idea that you define high blood pressure by a number. JNC7 uh, guideline published in 2003 and the 2017 American College of Physicians and American Heart Association guideline published in 2017. These guidelines, normal blood pressure uh, was unchanged from the uh, 2003 JNC7 to the 2017 ACC AHA um, guideline. Uh, but there was a large change in this broad area of prehypertension uh, which uh, in the uh, JNC7 uh, report uh, went from um, 120 over 80 to 139 over 89. And um, we broke uh, that into two categories, uh, elevated blood pressure and stage one hypertension, because there was an increasing risk of cardiovascular events occurring uh, as one stepped up from normal to elevated blood pressure to stage one hypertension. Um, so um, stage one hypertension currently is 130, 139 over 80 to 89. We then um, uh, made stage two hypertension, the previous stage one hypertension, uh, and that's anything over 140 over 90. And um, we uh, did not have any additional uh, stages in the 2017 guideline. Uh, of importance, blood pressure uh, to be classified into one of these categories needs to be um, based on an average of at least two careful readings on at least two occasions. And if the systolic or diastolic blood pressure is different in the two categories, the individual should be designated as the higher blood pressure category. To my mind, if your blood pressure is truly high for you, then it must be causing you some sort of damage. What I'm trying to say is that high blood pressure is associated with some sort of damage to the person whose blood pressure is high. Otherwise, it's not high. It's not high for that person. If you have a high number and it's not causing you any damage whatsoever, then that number is not high for you. Okay. And if you have a number which is looks normal compared to everyone else, but it is still causing damage to you, then that number is high for you. And I think it's really important to understand that and think of blood pressure, high blood pressure, as a number that is actually causing you damage. And therefore, if you can work out whether the number is causing you damage, then you can be more confident about treating the number in the hope that the damage will get less. Um, and thereby you can choose those patients to treat based on whether they're demonstrating signs of damage and that way you are more you know the number you're treating fewer patients but a 
bigger proportion of those patients will benefit. So the question then is, let's talk about damage. The first thing to understand is that it's not that you have a high number, nothing, and then one day have a stroke. What you have is if you have a blood pressure which is high for you, it will cause low level damage over a number of years. And that low level damage will then translate into high level damage, which is externally visible. The low level damage may not be externally visible. By that, I mean that the patient doesn't know that they're having that low level damage going on in their body. No one from the outside can tell that they're having that low level damage going on in their body until that point where high level damage occurs. The patient has a heart attack, which they'll know about and everyone else will know about, or the patient has stroke or the patient has kidney failure. So if we can detect low level damage, then that is very that can be very useful because it can identify those people whose blood pressure is high for them, regardless of the actual number. This slide shows the uh, thresholds in the 2017 guideline for drug treatment. And uh, of course, we don't, it didn't recommend any drug treatment for those with uh, normal or elevated blood pressure, just healthy lifestyle, non-pharmacologic therapy. Um, for stage one hypertension, which is 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, uh, the threshold was based on cardiovascular disease risk um, and the presence or absence of cardiovascular disease. If there was no cardiovascular disease or a very low 10-year uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, ASCVD risk, of less than 10%, then non-pharmacologic therapy was recommended. But if, if there was CVD or a high ASCVD risk, then antihypertensive drug therapy was recommended to be added to non-pharmacologic therapy. And um, the uh, patients with diabetes or chronic kidney disease, since they are at uh, much higher risk uh, than others, uh, were automatically placed in the high-risk category and uh, requiring um, antihypertensive drug therapy to begin with. Uh, for those uh, aged greater than 65 uh, years, uh, the um, blood pressure um, category of 130 to 139, antihypertensive drug therapy was also recommended because older people like diabetics and uh, patients with CKD have high cardiovascular risk. And of course, for stage two hypertension, which is greater than 140 over 90, um, irrespective of the cardiovascular risk, these uh, patients should be treat, uh, treated with antihypertensive drug therapy, uh, at least one, if not two drugs to begin with. This slide shows the uh, antihypertensive treatment targets uh, for the 2017 guideline. And of course, there are no treatment targets until you get into treatment uh, with uh, antihypertensive drugs. In which case, uh, whether uh, you have a high ASCVD risk or presence of CVD or diabetes uh, or CKD, uh, you should uh, aim for a target systolic blood pressure of less than 130, diastolic blood pressure less than 80. If you are in the older age category, greater than or equal to 65, uh, and your blood pressure is greater than or equal to 130, the target is less than 130 systolic. Now, uh, in terms of trying to understand low level damage, this is also called target organ damage. Um, the thing to understand is that patients with, high, with, when you have high blood pressure, our tiniest blood vessels tend to suffer the consequences of the high blood pressure first, which means that we have very tiny blood vessels and those tiny blood vessels tend to be fragile. And if our blood pressure is high, those tiny blood vessels can burst. And when they burst, they cause a little bit of tiny microscopic bleeding and then they heal by forming blood clots. Uh, and so if you can visualize these tiny blood vessels, you can tell whether there's low level damage. 
And you can visualize these tiny vessels because um, one of the best places to visualize these tiny blood vessels is in the back of the eyes, in the retina, uh, where you have the tiniest, tiniest blood vessels. So you can actually, a skilled doctor can actually look into the eyes and see whether there is evidence of damage to these small blood vessels. And if there is, then that tells you that that person's blood pressure, no matter what the number is, is probably high for them. Um, this is called hypertensive retinopathy. Another place where you can detect low level damage is in the kidneys, okay? The tiny blood vessels in the kidneys, if the blood vessels are damaged, the kidneys don't work as effectively and the kidneys start losing more protein. They're not able to absorb as much protein, they leak protein out into the urine and that protein can be detected by a biochemical analysis of the urine and that tells you. So another thing a doctor can do to detect that low level damage is uh, assess the urine and look for protein in the urine that that will tell them and this is called hypertensive nephropathy finally it's worth knowing that the heart has to pump blood around the body and if you have these tiny blood vessels that are getting damaged and healing by clotting off the amount of resistance that the heart has to pump against was going to go up because there's less blood vessels to pump the blood through so the heart has to work harder and as the heart works harder it adapts by becoming more muscular and you can actually look at the heart uh, on an echocardiogram and if it looks more muscular then that is another clue that that number is high for you and in that setting if you can identify that that number is high for you because you're already showing signs of low level damage then it obviously makes sense to be very aggressive about treating the blood pressure to minimize that low level damage. But if there is no low level damage, then one can be far more reassured that that blood pressure may not necessarily be high for that person. Of course, it's always a good idea for um, people to look after their lifestyle and wherever a doctor is worried about high blood pressure, they should always counsel people to lose weight, to eat healthy, to get good sleep, to manage their stress, etc but one doesn't necessarily need to consign them to medications for the rest of their life um, because at that point there is no evidence of low level damage. But in essence I think it's really important that we look for the thing that matters which is low level damage rather than just acting on the number because it's clearly obvious that the, there are people who are at risk and may have a, a normal number and then there are other people who have a high number and may not be at risk and it's important that the right people get treated and those people who don't need aggressive treatment with tablets which could cause side effects don't have to have them. Now having reviewed the classification of blood pressure uh, in terms of uh, thresholds and goals. <clears throat> there was a controversy surrounding the 2017 guideline recommendations when they initially appeared. Have the major guideline recommendations been validated? There are two reports. Uh, the first one is a comparison of CVD events and death prevented with adherence to two guideline recommendations. The 2014 evidence-based panel report, uh, which had uh, higher uh, thresholds and uh, goals of treatment than the 2017 guideline, uh, which had um, lower thresholds and goals. So again, the threshold for initiation of antihypertensive therapy in the 2017 guideline was blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 for the general population with low ASCVD risk. And if you had high risk, it was greater than or equal to 130 over 80. And then the goal, as you saw, was less than 130 over 80 as compared to less than 140, 90 or 150 over 90, depending on your age in the 2014 uh, report. Now, if you compare the uh, CVD events that were prevented uh, by adherence to these two guidelines. There were 270,000 in the 2014 evidence-based uh, guideline, as opposed to 610,000 in the 2017 guideline. And the annual reduction in death paralleled that at 177,000 for the 2014 report, as compared to 334,000 for the uh, 2017 ACCAHA guideline. 
The second uh, report was a simulated population impact of achieving and maintaining the uh, 2017 blood pressure goals in adults uh, greater than or equal to 45 years of age with hypertension compared to maintaining current blood pressure treatment and control goals or achieving blood pressure goals recommended in the uh, JNC report of 2003 or compared with the 2017 uh, 8th JNC panel report on blood pressure goals. And the estimates were made by using a population uh, called REGARDS, uh, weighted to the U.S. population. Uh, they used uh, the National Health and Nutrition uh, Survey for estimating the U.S. population and uh, used a meta-analysis published by Josh Bundy. Uh, it's a beautiful network meta-analysis on the CVD risk reduction with blood pressure lowering. They also estimated the um, serious adverse events with blood pressure lowering based on uh, pool data from the SPRINT and ACCORD uh, large clinical trials. And this analysis, um, showed that uh, the 2017 guideline uh, per, uh, uh, prevented 3 million cardiovascular disease events, the JNC7, 2.6 million, and the JNC8 panel report uh, down to 1.6 million events prevented. So two well-performed simulation studies demonstrate a highly positive population impact following the 2017 guideline recommendations for lowering uh, blood pressure in hypertensive persons compared to other guidelines. The increased risk of adverse events, which are largely reversible with lower blood pressure targets, should not be equated to the risk reduction of major clinical events. Significance, uh, a significant reduction in all-cause mortality shows that the benefits of treatment truly outweigh the risks. And these reductions or these results strongly support a lower blood pressure target, less than 130 over 80 in the management of hypertension. So given those reports, is there any association of blood pressure levels within the normotensive range with cardiovascular events or disease? And what do the data say about the uh, importance of primordial prevention? Well, what is primordial prevention anyway? Well, that is actions that inhibit the emergence of risk factors that form in the form of environmental, economic, social, and behavioral conditions and cultural patterns of living. But the key is prevention of the emergence of risk factors like high blood pressure. So the 2017 guideline lowered the systolic blood pressure SPP goal of therapy from less than 140 to less than 130. And this recommendation focused on the cut point at which there is likely to be benefit from antihypertensive drug therapy. But many individuals classified as low risk based on their ASCVD risk score still have subclinical atherosclerosis based on their coronary calcium scores and may not be truly at low risk. So is there an association between SVP within the normal range as currently defined and ASCVD in persons without traditional risk factors? So this study was conducted in 1400 adults uh, with 14 years of follow-up and you can see the results here that these deciles of blood pressure going from left to right, 90, 99, 100, 109, and so on, up to 129, all uh, within the normal uh, uh, or slightly elevated range are associated with stepwise increase in coronary artery calcium scores. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the incident ASCVD clinical events by baseline blood pressure shows that for a 10 millimeter higher uh, SVP, there is a 53% higher uh, increase in ASCVD. 
So in this cohort study then um, of 1,400 participants uh, without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, beginning with a blood pressure of 90, there was a stepwise increase in the prevalence of traditional ASCVD risk factors, coronary calcium scores, and the risk of ASCVD. And for every 10 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure, there's a 53% higher risk for ASCVD. So the results do highlight the importance of primordial prevention, that is uh, preventing the emergence of risk factors like hypertension to maintain optimal systolic blood pressure levels. The next question is, since the introduction of the current blood pressure guidelines, are there any, uh, is there any evidence for improvement in blood pressure control? And uh, certainly there is, um, because if we follow the NHANES data beginning back in 1999, you see this linear stepwise increase in uh, blood pressure control among all adults with hypertension. But something strange happened in 2014. And since that time, we've had a stepwise reduction uh, up to the final data point that we have available. One of the things that happened <clears throat> at that time was the uh, publication of the 2014 evidence-based panel report, uh, which did recommend uh, higher uh, blood pressure thresholds and targets as we reviewed before. And whether or not this has uh, something to do with it is conjectural at this point, but certainly seems uh, somewhat circumstantial. This also uh, applies to adults who are taking antihypertensive medication. Uh, the control rates increased until 2014 and then decreased. Concerns have been raised that the CVD event and all course mortality rate uh, of intensive blood pressure control can be offset by an increased rate of adverse events, especially in older adults. Uh, but there have been studies in the past two years that have thoroughly addressed this question and have provided evidence for protection, um, not only from these events, but for mild cognitive impairment and dementia with intensive blood pressure lowering. The concern about um, serious adverse events was put to rest by two reports from Steve Jershak examining the SPRINT data and doing uh, an aggregated individual patient data meta-analysis on the association of intensive blood pressure lowering with orthostatic hypotension. In SPRINT, orthostatic hypotension was more common in the standard treatment group and was not associated with a higher rate of CVD events or syncope, electrolyte abnormalities, injurious falls, or renal failure. In the meta-analysis, intensive uh, blood pressure lowering actually reduced the incidence of orthostatic hypotension, possibly due to improved baroreceptor function. So asymptomatic orthostatic hypotension during hypertensive treatment should not trigger automatic down titration of therapy, even in the setting of a lower blood pressure goal. This slide shows uh, the effects uh, in the meta-analysis of intensive blood pressure control uh, on orthostatic hypotension, and it was less uh, significant uh, than it was for um, uh, uh, standard treatment. This is with intensive treatment. And this slide uh, shows you uh, the effects of an extended uh, trial looking at mild cognitive impairment and dementia um, uh, in the SPRINT study. And this shows that with further follow-up, <coughs> uh, although dementia did not reach uh, significant uh, levels, mild cognitive impairment uh, was improved uh, with um, intensive blood pressure therapy uh, over standard therapy. And the combination of dementia and uh, mild cognitive impairment was also highly significant. And the reason uh, for this is the separation uh, by treatment arm uh, occurs much later uh, for dementia and mild cognitive impairment than it does for cardiovascular disease events. And this is shown here. There was a sub-study 
that demonstrated a smaller increase in cerebral white matter lesions in the intensive compared to the standard treatment group that again was highly significant. So major takeaway points from this talk. First, <clears throat> are that blood pressure control rates increased steadily until 2014, after which they've declined. Be careful to avoid NSAIDs in patients with hypertension. Substitute other classes of agents to control pain. Young adults with hypertension have earlier onset of CVD events compared to those with normal blood pressure. Thus, the delay of treatment may be inappropriate, even though randomized trial evidence is lacking. And the evidence does support initial management with lifestyle modification for six months to 12 months, followed by antihypertensive drug therapy if the blood pressure remains above 130 over 80. Lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of antihypertensive therapy. Each non-pharmacologic intervention is effective in lowering blood pressure. Concurrent use of two or more interventions results in additive effects, and there's improvement in the effectiveness of pharmacologic therapy as well. The relationship of dietary sodium chloride to blood pressure is positive and almost linear. Reductions in blood pressure can be expected with a decrease in dietary sodium down to 1 to 1.5 grams per day. And salt substitutes are effective in lowering blood pressure and improving outcomes. Intensive blood pressure control is not associated with increased hospitalization and does not increase the risk of orthostatic hypotension. Asymptomatic orthostatic hyperten hypotension in hypertensive adults is not associated with higher CVD event rates uh, or other detrimental effects and should not be a reason to withdraw or down titrate treatment. For older adults with hypertension, intensive treatment with an SBP target of 110 to 130 substantially lowers the incidence of CVD events <clears throat> over standard treatment with a target of 130 to 150. Uh, also, intensive blood pressure lowering may prevent or at least partially arrest cognitive decline with aging. And finally, home blood pressure, self-monitoring and telemonitoring are effective in facilitating antihypertensive drug titration, leading to the achievement and maintenance of blood pressure goals.